This is a production of Cornell University. So, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, today, I would like to show some results that you have got in Brazil for tropical corn. And some slides, I will show that our tropical corn is not so tropical. But you have work uh, in this species as tropical. And also, I would like to present some uh, issues that you have in Brazil and some perspectives for the coming future. So take advantage that you are paying attention to me. I don't know what will happen in your future. I would like to introduce my, my team, partners and support. Nowadays, I have 10 PhD students working in my lab. Uh, I don't have masters or I just one undergrad student that you call uh, PBIC. In, uh, in, uh, initiating in scientific or scientific school for undergrads. Also, I also have two technicians working with me. In the main, uh, the main reason f uh, f uh, that we organize our group and you have work or the main uh, goal of our group is tropical corn for the second growing season. In Brazil, we have two growing seasons. In the summer is the first, and we call the winter or the second growing season. Of course, in Brazil, we don't have a winter. If you compare like an Ifaka winter, we can have a fall or at least a spring. <laughs> so this second growing season uh, have increased in the last years, mainly in the last 20 years. And the demand of, for new hybrids, for new varieties for this second growing season also has increased. So we have some uh, international partners to develop our, our job. So, Jean-Luc is one of our uh, best partners in Cornell University. <laughs> you are here now. When you are not, <laughs> I changed the, the best one. <laughs> and Simti uh, Crossa is another guy that have a lot of our, some of our projects. Iowa State U University, Jaminu, Michigan State University, Gustavo de los Campos, and Andaman in Wisconsin. So besides corn, I also have some projects with another companies, some privates and others, uh, and other uh, f uh, the government companies. For example, I have some projects with Embrapa in Brachiara, a grass, a forage grass that cover nine million hectares in Brazil. It's maybe this is the most important crop in Brazil, B uh, mainly for beef cattle. So beans and coconut, all these projects related to apply genome selection, trying to, to improve the, the scheme and accelerate the, the, the way to select plants. I also have one project, ESC, at Campinas Institute Agronom in Café Arabica. It's a self crop. I also have projects with two private companies, one for tropical corn and another sign bean. To support all these students and researchers, uh, most of my fellowships and scholarships are provided by CAPS and CNPQ. These are federal councils that offer this scholarship for the students. I also have funding from FAPESP, it's a federal uh, foundation only for the uh, Sao Paulo state. And DuPont Pioneer. Two years ago, ago, I got an award called Young Professor Award based on my research in genome selection for tropical corn. So since then, they have supported my lab in genotype and some resources and exchanged some visits and ideas. So <coughs> a short overview of Braz about Brazilian corn. So the Brazilian corn had can be separated in two different ages, until 80s and after 80s. After 80s, uh, we had a great migration in the corn. This migration was due to new areas. The government and the price of the land stimulate farmers from the southern part of Brazil migrated to the central areas. And in these areas, the, the mainly crop was soybean. But the farmers need to improve the, the way to take advantage of the weather, because in that regions you can do more than one growing season per year. 
and also find a way to pay the machines, not only using once a year, but you, if you have weather conditions, soil conditions, you can you have two or three growing seasons and uh, divide the cost of the machines for two or per three. So this migration uh, until 80s, mainly 90% of corn, Brazilian corn, was produced here. Then we start this migration to these central areas that you call Cerrados. It's similar to savannas, African savannas. It's the same type of soil, the same type of weather. Uh, so 20 years ago, at, uh, approximately 20 years ago, the second growing season started in, for small farmers in this, this region here and became increasing year by year until five years ago when you had a switch. The second growing season we call safrinha, that in Portuguese, if you translate to English, it means small uh, growing season or small crop. So this small became the bigger. So five years ago we have this switch and nowadays the most important uh, growing season for corn is the winter grow. It's, it's the safrinha, okay, we call safrinha. So in this tendency, uh, the idea, uh, the, we expect this difference will increase in the coming years. Uh, of course, we will achieve a, cer a certain plateau. The, the, the summer growing season will not disappear, but we will reduce in some areas only for the southern part of Brazil. S and nowadays you can see in the central areas, uh, things like this. We have these combines harvesting the corn, and uh, so harvesting soybean, and at the same time you have some planters sowing the corn. It's common to see in the central areas of Brazil. When you harvest the corn, you can plant cotton or beans and so on. So we have these procedures uh, in, in almost all farmers, big farmers in this central areas. The problem is, when you change the growing season, we change, com you completely change the environment, the day in life, and also the rainfall, and the temperature. So, normally we plant the second growing season in January or early February, and we will harvest this, this corn in end of May or in the early June. We need that this corn develop pretty well during this first period here, onto the sowing, to the flowering time, where we'll have a great amount of rainfall, and the temperature is, tends to be stable across the year. The temperature is not a problem. In these areas, we have a lot of warm. Normally, it, this is the average. Normally, during the day, we have 104 Fahrenheit. And the, the problem is not during the day, the problem is at night. At night, the temperature keeps very high, and more than 80, 82. If you consider the optimal temperature for corn, if that's near to this temperature, that's okay if you see during the day this temperature. However, if you have this at night, we have a lot of respiration or breathing, but there is no photosynthesis. So the consumption for energy keeps in a high level. And maybe this is the reason that the Brazilian corn in the central areas uh, don't have, doesn't have a great yield or high yield levels in, in the central areas. And may, uh, for the coming years, this is one of the main interesting things to solve or to fix in the Brazilian corn change this angle or this part pattern here of the respiration curve. Trying that even, even though the plant is under high temperatures, the respiration rate uh, tends to decrease faster than uh, normally you have seen in the tropical corn. So we have other issues because we migrate the area, mig change the soil, change the weather, change the period of the year, so we have other issues. 
one of these is price stability. Now, we have these problems because we compete with soybean for areas, we compete with uh, other crops, so it's difficult to forecast what, what will be the amount of corn that you have in the coming uh, growing season. So sometimes farmers plant a lot, sometimes uh, there is no corn at all. So due to this price instability, some farmers try to predict how much nitrogen they will spend in this growing season. So normally they put low levels of nitrogen. So when you develop a new variety or new hybrids for these central areas, these new varieties must be nitrogen use efficient. Also, we have a pattern of rainfalls, but something else, something weird always happen. This rainfall season can be shorter or longer or just change the period. So we also need varieties, water use efficient, and at the same time, earliest, earliest as well. So normally we have hybrids in that, uh, in that region that from plant to flowering time, it takes 55 days, 52 days. But the idea is to reduce this, this period, but uh, don't ch without change the yield. So another thing is tolerance for high temperatures, mainly at night. Another thing is, until 20 years ago, we have our major part, our major production in the southern part of Brazil, and nowadays is in the central areas. We are not sure if we import new germoplasm and select these new varieties for these new areas, or just move these vari varieties for these new areas. So, one question, 20 years ago we had a temperate or subtropical germoplast, and nowadays we are working in central areas, like tropical areas. We have, we have worked with the correct germoplast, or just companies move the germoplast and try to select something good there. And another problem that we have is the Brazilian law for cultivar protection allows that anyone, anywhere, can take the new variety and use in your building program without pay any royalties, without any agreement, without anything. If I release a cultivar, John Luke can take at the same moment this my, my new cultivar and use to cross in his program. And it's necessary, uh, don't say thank you. <laughs> or no problem. So based on that, many companies left uh, those uh, germ those schemes to improve germ plants for a long term goals. And the idea is only recycling these materials. Take materials uh, for, from the other companies, sell the hybrid, select lines, cross with your testers, and see what happens. Like a loader game. In this loader game, the loser is the farmer. Because in the last 20 years, the thing that you have seen is a plateau of productivity. Mainly because if you sell a hybrid, this hybrid normally was obtained by a cross between two heterotic groups. When you sell this, you have like a, a real, a recombinant breed line that is like a mosaic between these heterotic groups. It's difficult to achieve the same level of heterosis again. And finally, is it possible to use genome selection to solve this thing? We have a fast migration, but we think the our general plasma didn't change so fast. So we need a tool to do this change and try to follow the same speed that this migration or the problems have happened. To address these three things, I brought three papers that we did during the last two years, trying to figure out what's, what happened in our germoplasm or what happened in Brazilian germoplasm. So the first thing is, what's your germoplasm? We published this paper uh, last year in PLOS One and tried to, un in order to understand what's your germoplasm, you take, we took 20 hybrids 
20 hybrids that was considered the most important hybrids in Brazilian fields, covering seven breeding companies from public to private companies. And these hybrids represent 90% of the Brazilian germoplasm. Can be in seed sales or in the area covered by these hybrids. We genotype these hybrids using the Illumina Golden Gate, a low density, uh, low density uh, panel, but I think it's necessary to cover genome and see the relationship between these germoplasm. DuPont uh, pioneers support to this uh, genotyping, and we also include the NAND parents, the NAND that was developed here, to see what's the relationship between uh, our hybrids and between our Brazilian hybrids and the parents that was used to form the NAND. So, the first result show we have seven companies, Agromen, and Agromen is it's Monsanto in Brazil. They don't use Monsanto, they select other uh, names. They have two branches trying to avoid some <coughs> problems that you know that Monsanto is not a uh, most friendly company. <laughs> so we see that Dow is the company that in average is more related with other companies. In average, you don't have a stronger relationship between the, the companies germoplasm besides Dow. So when you put these hybrids and try to figure out the structure, we see these partners, uh, it's almost the same. Here we have the 20 hybrids that we evaluate, and the companies, the general price of the companies tends to be separated. So it's, a, it's good. Different than we thought, when they try to sell hybrids from the other companies and use these lines in their, their general plus. Now, nowadays, this general plus is not so related. So as we expect, it, it's good. We have an, until now, we have a good amount of genetic variability. But my concern is for the coming years. If this behavior remain, what will happen in the coming years? My, but the problem that we identify is when you put these hybrids with the NAND parents. Here are the Brazilian, here the Brazilian uh, hybrids are. When you st put in the population structure, you can see our Brazilian hybrids that we thought that they are tropical, they are in the same group that in temperate and popcorn. And here you can see the tropical lines that were used to form the net. So as I expect, the companies didn't bring new germoplasts. They only moved the germoplasts for the central areas and tried to select something new. So our germoplasm is not so tropical as we thought. So to address the, sec uh, the first problem, to select for yield and flowering time, grain moisture, as you call, earliness, to try to select those things together, we did a very simple and classical uh, paper. We saw this, it was done for, uh, by my master student two years ago, and to address this problem, he used 60 foreign breed lines that we call at that time tropical lines, we evaluate these tropical lines for grain yield, days to flowering, and grain moisture. Grain yield, of course, production. And days to flowering in grain moisture is, in this case, is, uh, they are indicators for precocity, earliness. So we need one, one line or one hybrid that spend uh, a little time to flowering. And when I will har harvest this hybrid, the grain moisture tends to be very low. So we evaluate these lines during two years, two locations, and two levels of nitrogen availability. Based on the phenotypes, we proceed with two ways to analyze this data set. The blood single trait and the blood multi trait. In the blood single trait, I evaluate each one of these traits separately. Then 
I put all these traits together and use a multi trait. Then after I get I got these blups, we use three ways, three ways to do the simultaneous selection. The additive effect giving the same weight for each one of these traits. Mulamba mock that is the, the rank uh, selection index in independent cooling levels. To evaluate what is the best scenario you compare based on the gains and coincidence of selection for all these traits if I select just one per time. When you uh, evaluate the correlations of these traits, you, see, you can see that only days to flowering and growing moisture are related. So it was not expected in your general class, but this correlation is not so strong. And when you evaluate and compare the, the ways to predict the breeding values or the genotypic values of our, our, hybr our lines and our hybrids, you can see the blue single trait or multi trait for these traits are not so different because these traits, the covariance between these traits is not so high. So there is no correction uh, for between these traits in the, the ranks or uh, the genotypic values for the lines. On the other hand, if I select based on uh, index selection, rank, or culling levels, I can have completely different uh, results or hang, ranks. The best that we, uh, we identify is the additive model. It's a good news because it's the simplest. This is the simplest way. I just need to figure out what's the weight for each one of the traits. And when I plot these, these tr three traits here, identify I need one line that uh, uh, needs few days to flowering, that at the harvest time there is uh, uh, a little amount of water in the grains and also high levels of yield. Using this index, uh, s this uh, additive index in blue, uh, blue single tray, I could select the best lines for this purpose. So these simultaneous selections for a grain, yield earnings in, is possible. And the good news, using the simple way it's the most efficient way to do that. So we have nowadays a lot of markers. We have a lot of these fancy things, but you can solve some problems using classical breeding too. Finally, genome selection for nitrogen use efficiency. This paper was not published yet. We sent to crop science, uh, my PhD student, and with the uh, aid of CROSSA. We evaluate 739 hybrids. These hybrids uh, were obtained from a uh, pairwise uh, crossing between 49 grid lines. These hybrids were evaluated in two locations, two nitrogen levels for grain yield, plant height, and we genotyped the parents using the F matrix uh, uh, chip. After quality control, we had almost 54 K SNPs. And the idea is to select one hybrid that under low nitrogen conditions, this hybrid has a good performance. But if in that year, the farmers decide, oh, I will put more nitrogen. So I need one hybrid that at the same time is tolerant, but also responsive for nitrogen. I have, I, we need hybrids that these two phases. So because of this, we evaluate in two levels of nitrogen and try to figure out what's the best way to proceed genome selection under GBI. In this case, GBI is locations and levels of nitrogen. So these scenarios, we compared three models. The first model is the simplest one. The reaction norm across environment was where we have just the environment effects as fixed effects and the main effect for genotypes. The second one is reaction norm plus GBI effect as a random effect. 
The third is like a, a region regression. This, this, the, the, the first two models are GBLUB. The third one is GBAE model, uh, where it's instead of using GBLUB, we use RRBLUB. In this model, we have env environment effects as fixed effects. The main marker effect instead of main effect for genotypes. And we have a deviation or the effect of the GBAE marker effect. We also test two kernels. Uh, the linear, the most common, proposed by Van Rating Re in 2008, and the Gaussian kernel proposed less, almost two years ago. The Gaussian kernel, the only thing different uh, is this. When you will do the kinship matrix, we use this exponential between the distance uh, between each one of these individuals, and you divide by the median. Here, after some procedures, we use this bandwidth as equal one, trying to avoid some problems as like sparse uh, kinship matrices. When you use this second one, the Gaussian kernel, uh, it's similar to RHKS uh, method, where uh, that you can capture some non-additive effects. So our idea that using this Gaussian kernel, you can have different components of variance for each environment and capture these not linear uh, effects or non-additive effects uh, due to the GBI. The cross-validation, it's the Potter way. We use 80% of the hybrids to training set, at the end the, the, the remaining 20% for the testing. We use the second uh, way proposed by Burgenio that mimics a problem face for the breeders. We have some lines evaluated in some environments, but not in all environments. And we use a BGLR package. It's a Bayesian package for genome selection to, to run all these analysis. And the, result, the results that uh, we got was pretty good. For grain new, using our plant high, using that model, the region regression model, when I have the main effect for markers and the deviation effect for markers due to the GBI, for both traits, we have a great increase in accuracy. Almost 80% in plant height and 70% for grain new. So I can predict, regardless if it's in high nitrogen, low nitrogen, or the location, we can predict pretty well using this model. So this model using Gaussian kernel, Gaussian kernel seems to be better. And also, in much better than model, we can predict pretty well hybrids for this condition in, with low nitrogen or high nitrogen. We also have work on improved tropical inducers of haplides. When you bring these inducers from semi to our temperate areas and put in Brazilian conditions, normally the weather is too warm. So we cannot obtain any haplides. So one way is trying to cross with tropical corn <laughs> and try to select something more adapted for these high level temperatures. We also developed some R packets. I, I present these two packets here. Uh, the SNP Ready and B Breeder. The SNP Ready is a package to work with these bigger data sets for molecular markers. And B Breeder, it's an uh, interface with, uh, of R using Chine to teach and learn uh, plant breeding concepts. In my lab, the main reason and the main objective is quantitative, quantitative genetics in genomic studies. And always, we try to use our general plans evaluating for nitrogen use efficiency and related traits, like roots, uh, roots traits, or physiological traits, so, so on. Uh, since 2004, 14, we also uh, we made an uh, agreement with a private company 
and try to apply this high throughput phenotype in your germoplasm and trying to adapt something cheap, easy, and fast to collect this data and apply in the plant breeding. Uh, but the main reason for all these things separated is to integrate and develop a new breeding scheme. There is no reason to study some, some branches separately if you don't have one way, or if you don't think, how can I integrate and reshape my breeding program and transform my breeding program into something more efficient and something faster than before. So I present a lot of problems about <laughs> Brazil, but you have many things to do. And you can see the same problem in two, in two ways. A problem you can, see, can be seen as an opportunity too. I know that Brazil, about Brazil, we have a lot of misconceptions. I know that Brazil is seen abroad as bananas, monkey, uh, forest, anaconda, and so. We, you, we, hear, we can hear uh, weird things about Brazil. We are carnival, soccer, yes. Uh, we are all these things. It's part of nature, our nature, it's part of our culture. The misconception is we are not just these things. Brazil has won some of the best uh, universities in uh, agriculture colleges in the, in the tropical belt. So we have also in Brapa, Embraer, Petrobras, and big companies that have, have developed great uh, researches in many areas, in many fields. So this, the misconception is just to summarize Brazil in these things that is broadcast for to the rest of the world. On the other hand, we have real problems. The real problem in Brazil is corruption. And we don't know exactly how much money we threw away every year due to the corruption. That's our big problem. Besides these political issues, we have all ingredients to be successful, uh, thinking about agriculture. Because tropical areas are challenging. We have a great variability of environment in soils. These are the Brazilian map for the weather. So we have six seven different types of weather in just one country. And this, this is our Brazilian soil map. If you make a blend of these things, imagine the amount of environments that you, that you have in, uh, on hands to select and capture these interactions. Also, for mainly for this, in this light yellow area, we can have up to green through uh, up to free growing seasons. So with different weather across the year, with different uh, rainfall, different day lengths, so we have a lot of interactions. Also, we have a great diverse of pests and weeds. For me, it's a great source of a hypothesis. It's a great source of a hypothesis, many things to test uh, and try to figure out the problems. But maybe the, the, better, the best advantage that you have, nowadays we have 9 million hectares that is still av available. And I'm not talking about the Amazon forest. I'm talking about this area here. We have a great amount of land that you can use it for the coming years. So maybe there is no other, another country with the same amount of area available to expand the agriculture, to expand the research, and all other things. The problem in this area is transportation. We can produce pretty well in the tropical areas. We learn these things. We know how, can I do, how we can do these things. But the problem is, after we produce, after the production, how collect this production and drive this uh, production to the ports and export all these things. Probably this is the main issue for the coming years. The main issue is will not be genetics, will be logistics. But as your former president used it to say, yes, we can. Probably in the coming years, we have the solution for that. Thank you.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.